Good morning, everyone. Um, and it's a real delight to be back with my community. I feel often like a bit of an interloper with the heavy duty scientists of the world. So this is probably the, the high point of this particular COP. Um, so thank you again for, for the invitation to be here. Just a correction mark, I'm still a local government official. Um, so I have several hats that I wear, but the, the hat that I wear today is in my role as an IPCC co-chair. And for those of you who yes, it's the job one, thanks. For those of you who don't know who the IPCC is, it's Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, and we are 30 years old or young. Um, and the panel is made up of a group of countries, 195 whose job it is to assemble the best scientists in the world from the National and Social Sciences to do three things. Essentially to rally an objective source of information around the causes of climate change, the impacts of climate change, and the responses to climate change for policymakers to use in their decision making. And for most of the IPCC's history, it spent a lot of time on focusing on the first two elements, the causes and impacts of climate change. I refer to this assessment cycle as IPCC 2.0 because we're seeing now the science moving closer to providing the options related to solutions as Martin has indicated. Now that's a powerful place to be. The downside of it is though, whenever I introduce myself as a co-chair of the IPCC, people have this image in their mind. And it strikes terror into the hearts of most. And so today, I have to say, I am going to leave you to read the science. The science is clear, um, but I am not going to bog us down in that because we have moved forward in the 1.5 is a much stronger focus on looking at what the options for action are. And that's really what I want to underscore, is that this is not a scientific report, people. This is a political report. It's about science providing an objective source around the kind of options that we have in front of us, both in terms of the impacts we might experience, but also, more importantly, how we might respond to them. So, where does this big mandate come from? Well, in fact, IPCC was very brave. I was still a negotiator uh, way back in 2015 in Paris, um, and part of the decision text that was agreed to there was in fact to ask the noble institution of the IPCC to apply its mind to this idea of increasing the world ambition to 1.5 degrees Celsius. What does that mean? Is it possible? Could we do it? Were the questions we were asking ourselves in the negotiating hall. When that invitation came to the IPCC, the 195 countries, they said, well, that's a pretty cool invitation. I mean, how does this link to the real world? You know, you're going to show us a bunch of graphs. I mean, what, what will those mean? So scientists know that's not good enough. You're going to actually expand that language. You're going to think through the science. You're going to read those six thousand of papers. But you're going to think about that science in the context of the most pressing issues. So the threat of climate change, the desire to achieve a more sustainable development path, and importantly, probably the biggest goal that we have, the eradication of poverty. So this was the stretch goal that the IPCC laid out for its scientists. We then rallied it, and they began working through that process of assessing the literature. And I'm going to tell you what we found using the questions of the Talanoa Dialogue. So what do we know about where we are now, having read those 6,000 papers? Well, essentially we know that from pre-industrial, compared to pre-industrial, and we regard that for the purposes of this report between, between 1850 and 1900, we've already got one degree of global warming in the bag. And so we're not starting at a low point. We're really starting at a high point in terms of that global average temperature increase. And unfortunately, temperature continues to go up. If any of you have seen the Global Carbon Project's recent release, you can see why, because our emissions continue to escalate. And at our current rate of warming, which is about 0.2 degrees Celsius per decade, we're going to reach this first global goal of 1.5 degrees Celsius somewhere between 2030 and 2050. But the important uh, message is that 
that the amount of carbon dioxide we currently have in the atmosphere does not yet commit us to 1.5. So we still have agency. There's still the ability to act, still the ability to bend the curve. The problem is that no degree of global warming is safe. Don't feel complacent at one, because even at one degree, we are already seeing consequences for people, nature, and livelihoods. And we're seeing it in terms of extreme weather, we're seeing it in terms of sea level rise, we're seeing it in terms of the loss of plastic ice. So complacency is not part of what we should be doing. So if we already live in a world where there's a high degree of risk and certainly vulnerability and exposure both in our natural and human systems, where do we actually want to go to? Well, we really do want to follow the lead that the Paris Agreement set out for us because the science is clear, and this was a big surprise to the scientific community. When this invitation came out of Paris, many scientists shook their heads and said, this is not possible. Possible to, to detect the difference. Was that applause? <laughs> <laughs> um, it's not going to be possible to detect this difference between 1.5 and 2, but lo and behold, because of the response of the scientific community, the new science that brought to the table, we are, and this show a whole host of things. But most importantly, there are really clear benefits for human and natural communities to increase our emissions and aim for 1.5 instead of 2. And that's because we'll have less impacts from extreme weather where people live. We will have less sea level rise, so about 10 centimeters less. What that translates into is 10 million fewer people exposed to the risk of rising seas. But again, don't be complacent because that still means that somewhere between 30 and 60 million people will be exposed to sea level rise. We also see smaller reductions in the importance of crops. And we heard, I, I wish I knew where this thing was in the crop, because I haven't been able to find it in the This one key luxurious crop venue, we heard about the importance of maize to cultures and people, and how if you lose these crops, you not only impact on food security, but the belief systems of people. We also have 50% less people exposed to water stress, and less stress around ecosystems that we depend on. Several hundred fewer million people exposed to climate-related risk and susceptible to poverty, lower impact on biodiversity and species. Importantly, though, 1.5 itself is not a safe guardrail. Even at 1.5, and particularly at 2, there are going to be those places in the world, and Chris spoke to this because he lives near the Arctic, that have disproportionately high risk from even changes at 1.5. So the Arctic the dry land regions, so Prince from Ghana, yeah, it's scary, we said that many times, I was working with scary. Uh, the small island developing states and least developed countries. We also see benefits 1.5 lowers for health, livelihood, food security, water supply, human security, economic growth, all the basic essentials of sustainable development. So if you're going to work with these PGs, this is critical. But we know that you can put in place a wide range of adaptation options uh, to reduce these risks. And definitely we need less adaptation for 1.5 if we do that too. And this is the really important part. So having seen that risk and knowing where we get to, um, I see the furniture in I just knew that this was the next So let's look at what the report tells us about these four big systems. 
Obviously, top of mind for the negotiations is the energy system. We have a wonderful variety of complex tables that talk to us about these changes. But essentially, what this tells us is that fossil fuel has to go down dramatically. Um, this table shows us two of the pathways we looked at, one with the sustainability focus and one uh, in the middle of the road. In all of those, we have to reduce uh, the use of coal anywhere uh, over 50% to 75%. By 2030 and 2050, we've got to see an increase uh, in the use of renewable energies. So what does that mean? Essentially, we've got to decarbonize energy. We've got to get rid of fossil fuels, coal, Oil needs to stay in the ground, and some of our pathways we do see an increase in gas, but that's got to be accompanied by the use of carbon capture storage. We've got to see an increase in the use of renewable energies, um, and we've got to exit fossil fuel generation. We've got to electrify energy and use, so if we move energy into or onto a uh, platform of renewables, then we've got to electrify our end use. So We've got to ensure electrified motorization cars have to become electric. Move industry onto electricity and buildings. <coughs> Energy efficiency is a big call out in all of our pathways, it's a really important uh, intervention. And we must ensure that all of this infrastructure is obviously adapted to climate change. And that's an important message of the report is it has to be litigation and adaptation together. It's not an even more. In terms of the industrial systems, again, the report calls out the importance of energy efficiency as a critical in intervention, electrification, use of hydrogen, it talks about industrial carbon capture, utilization of storage, so for example, the capture of carbon into cement and using that to build biowaste industry and the circular economy. Urban and infrastructure systems, the one that's close to my heart is local government officials working in a city. Strong pull out on land use and urban planning, creating those economies of scale that allow efficient servicing. The adoption of low carbon transport fuels, again, an important um, move away from the use of fossil fuels in transport. The shift to public transportation, non motorized transport, smart grids, additional appliances, green infrastructure, and building codes and standards that are critical both for adaptation and integration. In terms of that, and the system transitions, the report speaks to a variety of interventions, things like reforestation, the sustainable intensification of agriculture, conservation of agriculture, ecosystem restoration, wetland management. And an important element that's emerging very strongly in all the work that the IPCC does is the use of local and indigenous knowledge, a way of understanding the local condition and finding ways to bring that knowledge into the formal assessment process of the IPCC. Um, we touched on that in this report, we're making great strides in the subsequent report. So, for example, in the Ocean and Crisis Special Report that we'll release next year, in the Polar chapter, there we have access directly to people who are holders of indigenous knowledge as part of the assessment process. So, really acknowledging this broader set of knowledges that need to contribute to the process. How do we get there? Well, we can only achieve this broad range of ambitious adaptation and mitigation through a move to sustainability. So that notion of sustainable development is the keystone, uh, is an important part of the development agenda because it enables the kind of rapid, far-reaching, unprecedented change that is required in these systems. The report lands on the fact that that drive for ambitious adaptation and mitigation and sustainable development is best achieved through development pathways with low energy demand, low material consumption, and low carbon food. So that's really where the sweet spot lies. But there are benefits and trade-offs. We can't live in cloud blow our land. If you're going to act ambitiously, there are going to be winners, but there are also going to be losers. And we have to think about who's going to lose and where they're going to lose and how we manage those trade-offs. So the trade-offs are as, as important as the synergies if we're interested in equity and social justice. Because of those concerns, the report underlines very importantly that this rapid, far-reaching, far unprecedented transformation and transitions has to be ethical and fair. 
We cannot act ambitiously and further marginalize the really poor and vulnerable. So we have to choose a careful mix of policies, and the report calls out very carefully the need for climate resilient development pathways. So pathways with ambitious adaptation and mitigation, focused on sustainable development with equity and social justice as core to that process. This implies that we are going to um, have to change the way that we do our business. We're going to move to these sorts of pathways. We're going to have to go to multi-level governance. So we're going to have to have all spheres of society talking to one another and at the table. And this is why these sorts of meetings are so important. There has to be innovation and importantly, there has to be a redirection of investment. We cannot continue to invest the way we're doing. We have to start revaluating our financial flows into the provision for example, of climate uh, resilience and low carbon infrastructure. So the, the underlying message of this overall book to the world, and I think that's why it's captured everyone's imagination, is that we have to have urgent and far-reaching action. And just to end off with what that, that is, um, global emissions have to peak before 2030 in all of the pathways that are compatible with so it's an entire misnomer. If you're reading Eco and all of those newsletters, they keep saying as their headlines, 12 years before the end of the world. You don't have 12 years. In fact, you probably have 12 minutes. Because if you're going to achieve those rapid, far-reaching transitions, you have to start acting now. You can't wait till the 11th year, the 11th month, and um, you know, sort of midnight on, on that day. So the emissions have to peak. The carbon dioxide emissions have to fall by 45% by 2030 um, and reach net zero by 2050. So what that means is the amount of greenhouse gases we put into the atmosphere have to be equal by the amount that we pull out. That's a tough charge by the middle of the century. We have to focus on ethical and fair transitions in this ambitious action. And the report is very clear on this. There is no geophysical reason why we should not be able to achieve all about the willingness of government and society now. So science is not the obstacle, the natural systems are not the obstacle, the obstacle sits in this room. So the question is, what are each of us going to do about changing that to ensure that we generate the world that creates these transitions?